Which comes first, overeating or obesity? Does eating too much make us fat? Or does the process of getting fat make us overeat? The answer to this question makes a huge difference in the way we treat weight problems and prevent chronic conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and perhaps even Alzheimer's. For years, Dr. Ludwig has been fighting to improve the food environment and is often described as the obesity warrior. Through years of meticulous research and over 150 published scientific articles, Dr. Ludwig holds the rank of professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health. He's a practicing endocrinologist and researcher at Boston Children's Hospital and the founder of the Optimal Weight for Life program. Now, the best-selling author is bringing his knowledge and research right to you. In this show, I'll take you on a tour of paradigm-shifting but little-known research dating back almost a century that turns dieting on its head. We'll see that standard low-fat weight loss diets are destined to fail because the body fights back against calorie deprivation. And I'll share some great news. A luscious high-fat diet is not only good for your waist, it's great for your heart. Learn how to conquer your cravings, retrain your fat cells, and lose weight permanently in Always Hungry with Dr. David Ludwig. He explains why the calorie counting method doesn't work and how it unfairly places blame on people for not being able to lose the weight. Dr. Ludwig reveals how cutting calories creates a battle between mind and metabolism you're destined to lose. So please join me as we expose the calorie counting myth and explore a delicious approach to weight loss that puts biology back to work for you. And now, Dr. Ludwig reveals the always hungry solution. I'm Dr. David Ludwig, endocrinologist and professor at Harvard Medical School. What I'm about to say may sound shocking. Overeating doesn't make you gain weight, not over the long term. The process of gaining weight makes you overeat. In other words, overeating is a symptom, not the cause of a weight problem. I know this sounds radical, but it's backed up by hundreds of research studies dating back nearly a century. And it means your weight problem isn't your fault. You may have felt blame or shame about being overweight, but I'm here to say that weight is more about biology than willpower. Something has triggered our fat cells to take in and store too many calories, leaving too few for the rest of the body. So we get hungry, our metabolism slows down, and we gain weight. Cutting back on calories only makes this situation worse, creating a battle between mind and metabolism we're destined to lose. Although we tend to think of obesity as a state of excess, to your body, it's really a matter of starvation. The solution is to treat the underlying problem, fat cells stuck in calorie storage overdrive. When that happens, calories flood back into the body, hunger decreases, metabolism speeds up, and you lose weight with your body's cooperation not with your body kicking and screaming. You've heard it a thousand times. Calorie intake minus calorie output equals calorie stored in the body, mainly as fat. So to lose weight, just eat less and move more. It sounds so simple, anyone should be able to do it. But there are a few problems with this calorie in, calorie out approach to weight control. First, it doesn't work, not for most people over the long term. Sure, you can lose weight for a short while, but after a few months, the weight usually comes racing right back. Researchers analyzed low-calorie diet studies in the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA, the world's two most prestigious medical journals. Overall, subjects in these studies lost a maximum of about 10 pounds just a small proportion of their excess weight, and most had regained much of the weight by one year. How many times has this happened to you? Yeah. How about exercise? 
As we'll discuss later, it has many important benefits, but for most people, weight loss simply isn't one of them. Time and again, the scientific studies have concluded that exercise is not very effective in the treatment of obesity. You're not alone. Overall, fewer than one in six people with excessive weight has ever lost just 10% of their weight and kept it off for just one year. I know this sounds depressing, but don't worry. Later in the program, I'll show you a new approach that can turn the situation around. The second problem with the calories in, calories out approach is that it's actually impossible to do in real life. Even nutrition experts can't accurately determine their balance to within 350 calories a day, just one extra muffin. A daily excess of this magnitude would cause massive obesity in just a few years. For that matter, if calorie counting were so important to weight control, how did humans ever manage to maintain a healthy weight before the very notion of the calorie was invented? let alone all those apps designed to track them. <laughs> and the third problem with the calories in, calories out approach is that it implicitly blames people. If losing weight is simply a matter of eating less and moving more, then everyone should be able to do it. And if you can't, you must lack discipline, self-respect, or even proper values. This way of thinking explains why you might be blamed for being overweight in ways that would never occur with other medical problems. In a thousand ways, our culture says it's your fault if you're fat. Some of you may have faced this injustice your whole lives. Unfortunately, many people have internalized these beliefs. One survey reported that a substantial proportion of adults would rather die 10 years earlier rather than be obese. And these attitudes begin very early in life. When children were shown images of other kids with various physical ailments, including one in a wheelchair, one on crutches, one with a facial disfigurement, one with no left hand, and one with obesity, they chose the heavy child for a friend last. If your child is struggling with obesity, you know what a burden that can be for a young person. But in reality, weight prejudice simply isn't justified. Studies show people with obesity aren't any different from the general population when it comes to personal characteristics like discipline, <coughs> values, and morals. In fact, the calorie in, calorie out approach fails because it ignores the biological systems that control body weight. Counting calories, technically a measure of heat, may work well for toaster ovens, but humans aren't inanimate objects. <laughs> when you cut back on calories, of course you'll lose weight. It's a basic law of physics. But the body fights back with rising hunger, slowing metabolism, and release of stress hormones that break down muscle. That's called the starvation response, and it primes your body to regain the weight. Think about it. Most people overeat because they're hungry. So what happens when you eat less? You get even hungrier. Are you supposed to spend the rest of your life feeling this way? And even if you could, your body has other tricks, like slowing down metabolism. This is a battle very few of us can fight for the long term. It's like trying to treat fever with an ice bath. Sure, you can force body temperature down for a short while, but the body fights back with severe shivering, blood vessel constriction, and you'd feel miserable. Treat the cause of fever with a drug like aspirin, and body temperature decreases naturally. You throw off your covers, you sweat, and you feel better. Treat the cause of obesity and you lose weight with your body's cooperation, not with your body kicking and screaming. So our primary approach to weight loss based on calorie balance doesn't work, can't work for most people in a real life setting, and blames people for that failure. This is not only a big problem for people with obesity, but also for our nation. 
overweight and obesity now affect more than two out of three adults and sadly, one out of three children. The impact of this epidemic is sure to rise for years to come unless we find a more effective solution. To understand this, we can think of obesity as evolving in a four-phase model. In the first phase, beginning in the 1970s, obesity prevalence rose rapidly. But it can take years for someone with obesity to develop a serious complication, like diabetes or heart disease. And it can take many additional years for those complications to result in a life-threatening event like heart attack, stroke, or kidney failure in phase three. We're already seeing ominous warning signs. In a nationwide survey, hospital admissions for stroke was studied between 1994 and 2007 as the obesity epidemic reached crisis proportions. During this period, stroke rates decreased among older adults, likely due to better treatment of high blood pressure and other risk factors. However, rates surged among children and young adults, especially those with obesity. We're also seeing type 2 diabetes strike at younger ages than ever before. It's one thing for an adult with obesity to develop diabetes at age 50 and heart disease at age 60. It's a very different thing if that clock starts ticking at age 10. In phase four of the epidemic, obesity may accelerate through generations. Babies born to mothers with obesity may face increased lifetime risk because they were exposed to higher blood sugar and other abnormalities in the womb. An intriguing laboratory study demonstrates this possibility. Female rats from one strain were divided into two groups. One group was fed a standard diet. The other was given a special diet designed to make them fatter. Then the rats were mated. The offspring of the fatter rats themselves became fatter, even though all the offspring had the same diet and the same genes. So the best time to prevent childhood obesity might be before birth or even before conception. In 2005, my colleagues and I predicted that obesity would shorten life expectancy by mid-century, as the first generation of children born during the epidemic entered middle age. Just last year, we reached a scary turning point in the US, decades ahead of prediction. After a century of rising lifespan, mortality rates spiked across the country, and the main causes of this increase were obesity-related, including diabetes and heart disease. Beyond the personal toll, the economic costs of obesity to society are already huge and projected to grow rapidly. Presently, total medical costs of obesity are more than $200 billion annually. Within a few years, the costs of diabetes, just one complication, may approach $500 billion annually, and by 2030, the costs of cardiovascular disease may reach $1 trillion a year. These massive sums could mean the difference between stability or bankruptcy of Medicare expanding or declining insurance coverage, decreasing or increasing national debt, and investments in or neglect of our national infrastructure. That's a topic that's been getting a lot of attention in the press lately. But this bleak scenario needn't come to pass. Remember, obesity is more about biology than willpower. So far, we've learned that the standard calorie in, calorie out approach to weight control rarely works is nearly impossible to do in a real life setting and blames people for this failure. Coming up, we'll learn that the basic cause of obesity is fat cells stuck in calorie storage overdrive. And I'll show you a three-phase program called the Always Hungry Solution to tame your fat cells and lose weight without the struggle. <laughs> According to the calorie in, calorie out approach, people gain weight because they failed to control their calorie balance in the modern food environment. 
surrounded by tasty high calorie foods, it's easy to overeat. And with our sedentary lifestyle, we don't burn off those calories. So the excess builds up in our bloodstream and gets deposited into fat cells, making them grow. The simple solution, eat less and move more. This way of thinking puts the responsibility squarely on you to control your calorie balance. The USDA MyPlate website neatly summarizes this mindset. Quote, reaching a healthier weight is a balancing act. The secret is learning how to balance your energy in and energy out. That is indeed a very well-kept secret. <laughs> And if you like the calorie in, calorie out approach, you've got to love a low fat diet. Fat has more than twice the calories per gram than protein or carbohydrate. Based on this way of thinking, fat should automatically lead to overeating, whereas carbohydrates should protect against it. Remember the food guide pyramid of 1992? We were told to load up on these processed grains six to 11 servings a day, and additional potatoes right there. <laughs> but we were supposed to avoid all high fat foods like nuts, olive oil, whole milk, and fatty fish. This means you could have bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes with every meal of the day and still meet these guidelines. I mean, imagine how you'd feel with all that carbohydrate. <laughs> even sugar was viewed as benign at worst or possibly even beneficial because it had fewer calories than fat. One team of experts in the 1990s typified this view, saying, quote, when people are allowed to eat from ranges of high fat or high sugar foods, passive overconsumption, meaning overeating, occurs only with fat. It follows that fat promotes overconsumption, while sugar probably prevents it. <laughs> really, as we will see later, this is completely wrong. The government, in its Healthy People 2000 report, called directly on the food industry to market thousands of new processed foods that were reduced in fat and saturated fat. The food industry, was more than happy to accommodate because it was great for profits. They replaced fat with sugar and starch, which are actually cheaper, called these factory foods healthy, and charged a premium price. Soon, supermarkets filled up with fat-free cookies, low-fat salad dressings, reduced-fat peanut butter, dry popcorn, baked potato chips. Even sugary drinks were touted as Fat-free. <laughs> really? I mean, hard to believe this was just 15 or 20 years ago. As a result, the proportion of calories in our diet from carbohydrates went up. The proportion of calories from fat went way down. But things didn't work out so well. And obesity rates skyrocketed during those years. Instead of helping, the focus on reducing fat in our diet directly contributed to the epidemic. In fact, five recent scientific reviews found that low-fat diets are inferior to all higher-fat diets, including Mediterranean diets, low-carbohydrate diets, very low-carbohydrate diets, and ketogenic diets, the granddaddy of all high-fat diets with up to 80% fat. So why is the calorie-in, calorie-out approach and its low-fat diet failed so miserably? The answer has actually been known in the research laboratory for years. Body weight is controlled by biology, including powerful hormones that, that tell fat cells whether to grow or to shrink. When you cut back on calories, of course you'll lose weight. But the body fights back with rising hunger, and slowing metabolism. And these changes push body weight back right to where it started. You may have experienced this yourself. 
Sure, it can be exciting to see the scale change quickly with a low-cal diet, but how did you feel after a few weeks or after a few months? The system also works in the other direction. When subjects in force-feeding studies are given hundreds or thousands of calories too many, they, of course, gain weight. But their body fights back. They lose all interest in food, and their metabolism speeds up in their body's attempt to shed those extra calories. You know, once the force feeding ends, their weight predictably comes right back down to where it started. Just think of how you felt after your last huge Thanksgiving dinner with too much turkey, stuffing, trimmings, and dessert. You probably didn't want anything to do with food for a while. This is how your body fights back against too much food, just as it does against too little. This research shows us a phenomenon we intuitively know. We have a sort of set point, a weight that the body fights to maintain, lower for some, higher for others. You might know someone who's able to eat all they want and still remain thin. Perhaps you're someone who can gain five pounds just walking past a bakery. If so, life might feel a little unfair. But this raises a fundamental question. If people have the set point, why is average weight increasing year after year? Our genes haven't changed during that time. In the 1970s, a typical man might have naturally weighed about 160 pounds without dieting. But today, that man's body is fighting to maintain a weight of about 190 pounds. The answer is, we've had it backwards all along. Something has triggered our fat cells to take in and store too many calories, leaving too few for the rest of the body. That's why we get hungry and why our metabolism slows down. The fundamental problem in obesity isn't too many calories in fat cells, it's too few in the bloodstream available to nourish the brain and the other organs. Cutting back on calories only makes the situation worse, creating a battle between mind and metabolism we're destined to lose. We tend to think of obesity as a state of excess, but your body is actually crying out for help because it thinks it's starving. So what's triggered our fat cells to store too many calories? One obvious culprit is too much of the hormone insulin. I call insulin the miracle grow for your fat cells, just not the sort of miracle you want happening in your body. <laughs> Without insulin, you can't gain weight. In type 1 or juvenile diabetes, the body can't make enough insulin. A child with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes will have typically lost weight no matter how much he or she has been eating, 5,000, 7,000, or 10,000 calories a day. Treat that child with the right amount of insulin, and weight returns to normal. Give that child too much insulin, and excessive weight, weight gain will predictably occur. If you don't have diabetes, the most important influence on insulin levels is the amount and type of carbohydrates you eat. Calorie for calorie, processed, fast digesting carbohydrates raise blood sugar and insulin more than any other food. These include all those starchy and sugary foods that flooded our diets during the low-fat craze. White bread, white rice, potato products, cookies, crackers, chips, candy, and of course, sugary drinks. Refined starchy foods can be just as much a problem as sugar. Starches are nothing more than molecules of the sugar glucose in a long chain. Try this experiment yourself. Take a bite of a bagel and chew it thoroughly. Do you notice its taste begins to change? Does it start to get sweet? That's sugar popping off of the starch under the weak effects of enzymes in saliva. Once that bagel hits the powerful enzymes lower down in the digestive tract, it melts into glucose. 
So for breakfast, you could have a bowl of cornflakes with no added sugar, or a bowl of sugar with no added cornflakes. <laughs> they might taste different, but below the neck, they're both going to cause trouble. By contrast, natural carbohydrates like non-starchy vegetables, whole fruits, beans, and minimally processed grains have a much more gentle impact on blood sugar and insulin. And fat has virtually no effect on blood sugar or insulin at all. This is a key point in designing more effective approaches for weight loss. So to recap, too much insulin secretion means weight gain. And the foods that increase insulin the most are the processed carbs, not just sugar, but also starchy foods. Let's have a look at what happens in the body after eating meals with the same number of calories, but varying in type and amount of carbohydrates. In this study, we gave teenagers three different breakfasts on separate days. Instant oatmeal, which is a fast-acting carbohydrate. It's designed for instant cooking, but it's also instant digesting. Old-fashioned oatmeal, or steel-cut oats, which is a method of preparing that our grandparents did. It takes longer to cook, but also longer to digest, and it has a more gentle effect on blood sugar. We also had a third meal, a vegetable omelet with some fruit uh, that had no grain at all, a little more fat, and a little more protein. After the instant oatmeal, blood sugar initially surged, but what goes up must come down, and then crashed a few hours later. How does that crash affect the body? The stress hormone epinephrine, or adrenaline, secreted at times of emergency, stayed stable after the vegetable omelet or the steel cut oats, but surged to high levels after the instant oatmeal. Now let's consider what might happen to a 10-year-old boy at school a few hours eating a typical high-carb breakfast of sugary cereal, fat-free milk, and orange juice. With blood sugar crashing and adrenaline surging, would that boy be sitting quietly and paying attention? <laughs> or would he be distracted and fidgety and perhaps shooting spitballs at the kid next to him? <laughs> and what condition would his teacher think he had? Probably ADD or attention deficit disorder. Which isn't to say that all ADD is caused by diet, but it's curious that the prevalence of ADD has increased in parallel with consumption of highly processed carbohydrates and with the childhood obesity epidemic. Returning to weight control, how would somebody feel as the calories in the bloodstream crashed? Hungry. When we gave subjects free access to food, they may ate many hundreds of calories more after the instant oatmeal than after the other two meals. If just a fraction of this difference were maintained meal after meal, day after day, it could account for the entire obesity epidemic. So what happens in the brain as blood sugar crashes? To answer that question, we gave 12 overweight men one of two milkshakes, either fast-acting or slow-acting. But otherwise, they had the same calories, protein, fat, and carbohydrate, and even the same sweetness. Again, we saw blood sugar surged, and then crashed after the fast-acting milkshake. And four hours later, we looked at their brains with uh, something called fMRI. It's an imaging study. And we saw one area lit up like a laser, this yellow area here, after the fast-acting milkshake. That area is called the nucleus accumbens, which is considered ground zero for the classic addictions of cocaine, heroin, and alcoholism. <laughs> raising a provocative possibility that the processed carbohydrates we've been eating so much of lately may hijack our basic pleasure and reward centers, setting the stage for food addiction. Wow. It's one thing to be hungry, but once your nucleus accumbens kicks in, it's game over. Your chances of resisting that 500-calorie cinnamon bear claw <laughs> are slim to none. Ultimately, we need longer studies to see how processed carbohydrates affect the body, 
but these are difficult and costly to do. After a while, participants typically return to their usual ways of eating. So it can be hard to reach meaningful conclusions from that sort of study. We can, however, control the diet of laboratory animals. In one study, we gave rats identical diets differing only in carbohydrate type, again, fast acting or slow acting. After a few weeks, the animals eating the fast acting carbohydrate developed higher insulin, they became hungrier, and their metabolism slowed down, just as predicted. So we put them on a reduced calorie diet to stop them from gaining excessive weight. Even so, they still became much fatter than the rats eating the slow-acting carbohydrates, and their heart disease risk factors skyrocketed. In other words, the animals consuming the fast-acting carbs ate less, but still developed more body fat. This finding completely defies the calorie-in, calorie-out way of thinking. You've been told your whole life that if you just eat less and move more, you'll solve your weight problem. The science suggests it's not so simple. To explore this in humans, we conducted a feeding study with overweight volunteers, providing them all the foods they ate for seven months. First, we reduced their weight by 10 or 15 percent on a low-calorie diet. Then we studied them for a month at a time on each of three diets with the same calories. Low-fat, high-carbohydrate, medium-fat, medium-carbohydrate, or high-fat, low-carbohydrate, with a whopping 60 percent of fat. And here's what we found. On the low-fat diet, metabolism plummeted by more than 400 calories a day. But metabolism didn't slow down at all on the high-fat diet. A drop in metabolic rate this big will likely make you feel cold and tired, less likely to get off the couch and exercise, and more likely to head for the refrigerator in search of food. So the type of calories consumed may affect the number of calories burned. If this difference were permanent, it could help you lose more than 30 pounds without eating any less. If you were less hungry and did eat less, the effects could be even greater. In other words, you could eat the same amount and lose weight by changing the type of foods you eat. And we'll see later what type of foods may provide this benefit. A large study from Europe suggests that these effects do persist. Researchers put about 800 people who had lost 8% of their weight onto one of four test diets, varying in carbohydrate amount and type. Subjects on the diet with less total carbohydrate and an emphasis on slow-acting carbohydrates showed perfect weight loss maintenance, an impressive accomplishment rarely seen in weight loss studies. Those eating the most total carbohydrate and an emphasis on the fast-acting carbohydrate gained the most. And those in the middle two groups gained an intermediate amount of weight. Of particular interest, all groups reported eating the same number of calories. More evidence that all calories aren't alike to the body. So we've seen how processed carbohydrates raise insulin and trigger fat cells to hoard too many calories, increasing hunger and slowing metabolism. But other aspects of our diet also affect fat cells, such as the type of fats we eat, the amount and type of protein, vitamins, minerals, fiber, and probiotics, or good bacteria. In addition, sleep, stress, and physical activity levels play a critical role beyond how we typically think about them. For example, you could spend 20 grueling minutes on a treadmill and regain all of those calories in just one minute with a handful of raisins. I didn't program the system that way. But enjoyable physical activities, quality sleep, and stress relief play a key role in other ways than we typically think about them, in stabilizing hormones and supporting metabolism. Although the science we've considered in this segment may seem radical, 
it's not new. The editors of a famous medical journal published an editorial questioning the standard calories in, calories out approach. They wrote the following, and I'll paraphrase. Some claim that the fat woman has the remedy in her own hands, or rather, between her own teeth, implying that obesity is just a bookkeeping error. Although logic suggests we can alter the balance sheet by eating less or exercising more, the problem is not really so simple and uncomplicated as it is pictured. These words were written by the editors of JAMA in 1924. Let's have a look at three studies on dietary fat that shook the foundations of nutrition in the last decade. The Women's Health Initiative clinical trial assigned about 50,000 women to a low-fat diet or a control. The low-fat diet group received intensive support, including multiple individual and group sessions. The control group was just given written educational materials. Despite being designed to favor the low-fat diet, there was no reduction in cardiovascular disease after eight years. Another low-fat diet study, the look-ahead trial, included 5,000 patients with diabetes who were at high risk for heart disease. This study was also designed to favor the low-fat diet because that group got more intensive support than the control group. Look Ahead closed early for futility when an early analysis showed no benefit of the low-fat diet and no likelihood that that diet would ever show benefit. In contrast, Predimid was a high-fat diet study. They assigned 7,500 people to three groups. One group got an ounce of nuts every day. The second group got a liter of olive oil a week per person. That's a huge amount of fat. You know, a nightmare from the calorie balance perspective. And the third group got a low-fat diet. Unlike the other two studies, the investigators made efforts to treat all groups fairly by providing them with equal attention. Predimid also closed early, but in this case, because the results were so dramatic, cardiovascular disease rates dropped so fast in the higher fat groups, the findings were considered conclusive years ahead of schedule. Predimid also prevented the development of diabetes, which makes a lot of sense. For decades, the conventional approach has been a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. But why would we give so much carbohydrate to peoples whose bodies, by definition, can't tolerate it? Furthermore, Predimed showed other extraordinary benefits for the high-fat diet, including lower incidence of breast cancer. No low-fat diet trial has ever shown anything like that. So the two biggest low-fat diet studies failed whereas the high-fat diet study succeeded beyond expectations. When it comes to specific foods, processed carbohydrates like refined grains, potato products, and sugary beverages top the list for weight gain, diabetes, and possibly even neurodegenerative diseases. But nuts, olive oil, and dark chocolate, some of the highest fat foods in existence, seem to be protective. And we've been told to banish these nutritious, delicious foods from our diet. A shocking new study suggests that the focus on reducing dietary fat may have actually cost lives. Among 125,000 adults followed for up to 32 years, those consuming the lowest fat diets had a 19% higher risk of premature death than those consuming the highest fat diets. Though it's important to note that the types of fats people ate also had an important influence. Which is not to say that all low-fat diets are inherently unhealthy. Some cultures around the world have maintained excellent health, eating relatively little fat, especially in Asia. But what works for farmers or fishermen, laboring 12 hours a day, won't necessarily apply to the US, where most people have sedentary jobs and at least some degree of insulin resistance. Even for people with normal weight, 
Poor diet, sedentary lifestyle, stress, and sleep deprivation can cause insulin resistance. And what works for one person may not work for everyone. We're all different, whether it's our genes, early life influences, past health, or other factors. We need to think beyond the one-size-fits-all approach to a new era of personalized nutrition. Maximum health benefits, minimum dietary restriction. The bottom line is that a higher fat diet is easier and more effective than conventional diets for most people. It's also tastier. And that's the focus of our three-phase always hungry solution. The program ignores calories. And instead, it targets high insulin and chronic inflammation, the twin troublemakers underlying obesity and many chronic diseases. When insulin levels drop, your fat cells calm down and release their stored calories back into the body. You feel less hungry, your metabolism speeds up, and you feel good, the opposite of what usually happens on calorie-restricted diets. And because this approach works with, not against your body, you eat until satisfied, snack when hungry, and never count calories again. You'll enjoy. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? Get ready for this, because you're going to enjoy nuts and nut butters, full fat dairy, rich sauces and spreads, savory proteins with vegetarian alternatives, and real dark chocolate. But this isn't an Atkins-type, very low-carbohydrate diet, either. You can eat a range of natural carbohydrates. Phase one is designed to jumpstart weight loss with 50% fat, 25% protein, and 25% carbohydrate. You'll give up for just two weeks grain products, potatoes, and added sugar. But with these luscious, high-fat foods, you'll, you won't miss all the processed carbs at all. Let's have a look at a typical day on phase one. For breakfast, huevos rancheros with raspberries and full-fat Greek yogurt. Morning snack, herb-roasted Parmesan chickpeas. Lunch, steak salad with real blue cheese dressing or a vegetarian alternative. Afternoon snack, apple and almond butter. Dinner, coconut curry shrimp on a bed of spinach, but we're not done. You get to have dessert every night, such as strawberries dipped in real dark chocolate. And this is the most restrictive part of the program. No deprivation here. This is a boot camp for your fat cells, but not for you. Then in phase two, you can add back whole kernel grains like steel-cut oats, brown rice, buckwheat, and quinoa. You can also have non-starchy vegetables like yams, sweet potatoes, and squash. Just no white potato for now. You can even have a touch of sugar. We recommend using maple syrup or raw honey rather than table sugar. With their stronger flavors, a little goes a longer way. You'll stay in phase two as long as you continue to lose weight until reaching a new stable lower plateau, your new lower body weight set point. For some people, that may be just 10 or 15 pounds. For others, a lot more. And then in phase three, you can mindfully add back a modest amount of the more processed carbohydrates according to your body's ability to handle them, creating a personalized prescription that's right for you. After a few months on a lower carbohydrate diet, some people can do fine with some white bread, chips, or sweet treats on occasion. But for others, any amount of these foods will set off a cycle of craving, overeating, and weight gain. For them, the rewards of being in control of hunger will outweigh the fleeting pleasures of processed carbohydrates. The program also includes three life supports with a focus on quality sleep, stress relief, and enjoyable physical activities. 
These important practices work with diet to help fat cells calm down and release their stored calories back into the body. We especially recommend a daily passeggiata, the Italian word for a relaxing walk after dinner. The goal isn't to burn off a lot of calories. Instead, the passeggiata provides an enjoyable opportunity to improve metabolism and control blood sugar while preparing your body for a restorative night's sleep. We conducted a 16-week pilot test of the program, including 235 people from around the country. Many of the participants were surprised how quickly their relationship with food changed. I'd like to share three brief stories with you in our participants' own words. Holly from Raleigh, North Carolina said, my main obstacle to completing any weight loss program was difficulty managing hunger and cravings. I was ravenous most of the time, but somehow never felt satiated. On this program, I have thoroughly broken my addiction to sugar, soda, and bread. It's rather remarkable. The psychological impact of feeling like I have dominion over my own cravings is huge. I just don't have a taste for that stuff any longer. That's not to say I won't ever have a piece of birthday cake or other refined carbs, but I don't crave them with a burning passion. It's more like, well, that might be nice. I think I'll have one. Before it was, how much of those can I eat without anyone noticing? <laughs> We've all been there, haven't we? Nancy from Eden Prairie, Minnesota said, I now have the strongest connection between my mind and my body I think I've ever had in my life. I used to live from the head up with no understanding of how to nurture myself. Being disconnected from my body meant I could eat too much refined carbs, drink too much alcohol, and not exercise, burying unpleasant feelings in a fog of overindulgence. Now I'm checking in with myself all the time. I also have new confidence that I can trust my body to tell me what it needs to be healthy. And how absolutely amazing that I now know what feeling at peace feels like. And Donna from Sella, Washington told us, my husband said he did think I was on a diet. He said, diets are full of deprivation, and since I wasn't feeling deprived, I couldn't call it a diet anymore. <laughs> it does feel good not to be driven by my stomach. I feel so different in such a good way. But we don't end here. After improving our own health and that of our family, it's critical to turn our attention outward and join with others to make society a healthier place for everyone to live. Diseases of poor nutrition affect everyone through higher insurance costs, increasing Medicare spending, and the massive drag on our economy. Why can children get sugary chocolate milk in school as long as it's fat reduced, but plain whole milk is prohibited? Why are some neighborhoods a paradise for junk food, but a desert for healthy foods? And why does the government still promote low quality commodity products like high fructose corn syrup instead of much more healthful vegetables, fruits, beans, nuts, and proteins? We must all work together so that healthful foods and lifestyle choices are also convenient and affordable. A healthy food supply must be a top national priority. But the place to start is with ourselves and our families. As they say on airplanes, it's important to put on your oxygen mask first yeah. before helping others. And now I invite you to forget calories, focus on food quality, and let your body do the rest. <laughs>